so tonight, I'm really excited to introduce Kevin Corwin here. He began studying bluebirds in 2003 when the Audubon Society of Greater Denver took on the management of Colorado Bluebird Project and formed a team of volunteers to define the project's mission and goals. As a member of that team, Kevin has volunteered ever since by overseeing operations, delivering educational programs to gr groups around the state, and managing the Volunteers to Trails matching program. He is also one of a team of three volunteers who monitor a trail of 44 nest box around South Denver, so that's pretty cool. Um, and also, in addition, Kevin serves on the board of directors of the North American Bluebird Society as the first vice president for affiliated relations. So if we could all give Kevin a round of applause and welcome him tonight. Slideshow, there we go. <laughs> okay, thank you, and, uh, Before I start, I do want to thank ACES and Roaring Fork Audubon and Wilderness Workshops for inviting me up here to put on these programs for you folks. This is my first time in Aspen. But to my defense, I've only been in Colorado for 50 years. <laughs> so. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about bluebirds and a little bit about some of the other guys that use our nest boxes. And uh, a little bit about what you can do to help them. But I'm, this isn't going to be a classroom thing on how to monitor boxes or anything like that. So this is who we are. And our mission is, as it says there, to improve the vitality of the bluebird populations in Colorado. Bluebirds have never really been in trouble in Colorado. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge about the problems that they had back east because we, it was habitat destruction. It was noticed first in the 30s and the 40s. And of course, the pesticide issues, DDT and all of that stuff, uh, the birds back east got hammered, but that really didn't happen out here. You didn't see much DDT being used in the mountains of Colorado, okay? So, this is what we do. Educational programs like this one, and nest box sales, we sell nest boxes. We have a, a sample of one here at the, no, that's not, where'd it go? There it is. These things are bomb proof but they're not bear proof, so. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing is bear proof, is it? Is there anything up here that's bear proof? Probably not. Uh, we, another thing we'll do is site evaluation and front end assistance. If somebody wants to set up a line of boxes and they want us to take a look at the property that they're intent on using, we'll take a look at it. No matter where you are in the state, we'll take a look at it and try and help you either get it right or walk away from it. A lot of times something looks pretty good, but then when you start looking at the details, you find out, well, hey, wait a minute. This place is predator rich or uh, it's really prey poor. Whatever it is, uh, you don't want to get it, put your boxes up in a place that's not going to be good for the birds. Volunteer trail matching service. Uh, she mentioned that a few minutes ago. If you're one of them, monitor some boxes, but you live in a high rise in downtown Denver, you're not going to get bluebirds on, out on your balcony, <laughs> okay? But we will try to find somebody who's got a, a line of boxes who needs some help monitoring within your range of travel and vice versa. If you're a trail manager and you need some help, we will try to locate somebody to get fired up and come out and help you. Nest Watch data entry support. Uh, Nestwatch is a database at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and we really want people who monitor the boxes to post their data into Cornell, because if you don't, it's, it's just a hobby. 
and we want it to be more than a hobby. We want you to be part of a larger scientific community that is enabling the scientists and the researchers at places like Cornell and at Arizona University and a couple other places to be able to get into a large data set that's nationwide, more than nationwide, a lot of these birds are in Canada, and tease out things that the rest of us can't even dream of, okay? So, but they can't do that if we don't give them the data. Uh, we also have an email helpline. Uh, basically, if you are got a problem in your boxes and you, you, know, you open a box up and you find a bunch of broken eggs, you can shoot an email to our uh, little address there and it'll, actually it comes to me eventually. And I usually don't know the answer, but I usually know somebody who does, okay? And we'll get that answer back to you. We also have a Google group, or it's, the old term that I'm used to is listserv, where a whole bunch of people are on a listserv and I put a message out there and all 150 people who are on it get the message, okay? And it's a great way to correspond especially if you want to brag about something that you got going on, or if you've got an issue. You know, hey, I've got a problem with my boxes. Anybody else got this problem? How did you solve it? That kind of stuff. Use the whole community. And of course, we've got a Facebook page. I know nothing about it. <laughs> I don't do Facebook. Okay. So, so that's us. So this is, I like to think of this as our impact. When we started in 2003, the, only 86 nest attempts were reported to the folks at Nest Watch out of Colorado. Over 1,600 this last year. Now, I'm not saying that we increased the number of bluebirds, that quantitative amount. We, re we increased the amount of reporting. Those, those box, a lot of those boxes were, had been monitored for years, but people didn't do anything with their data. That was one of the reasons we took over the, Co the Colorado Bluebird Project. Parks and Wildlife had it before us, and they weren't reporting to anybody. They were just stacking up sp spreadsheets in a corner somewhere. Uh, 7,000 eggs. Wow, what an omelet. Anyway, here's an I give you an idea of what reporting to NestWatch does for you. This is out of the NestWatch de uh, data set. All these little dots are nest box trails that report to them, okay? So look at Colorado. Now, I'm gonna tell you, these guys and these guys and these guys and those guys, Wyoming, I know Nebraska. Nebraska has a huge data set. They have 25,000 nest attempts every year. 25,000. They don't report them to anybody. It's the world's biggest secret. And look how blank they are. <laughs> There's no data for anybody to use. It bothers me. It really bothers me. But here in Colorado, this is what we've done over the last few years. So, blank screen. Not really. Western bluebird, eastern bluebird, and mountain bluebird. We're one of the few states in the nation that can claim all three. You, I'm sure you all knew that we have mountains here. I know some of you are monitoring some boxes around. Westerns, you're not going to find them around here. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We have a few eastern bluebirds, maybe 150, 200, way out in the eastern edge of the state. In the riparian areas running out the rivers that run out into Kansas and Nebraska, like the Republican drainage and the Arkansas drainage. Western bluebird and eastern bluebird look a lot alike. This guy's just sort of mad. <laughs> <laughs> but you notice how it's rusty all the way up to the chin? This guy's blue. Okay. This guy's got some rust on the back. This guy don't. And these are the guys. Whoop. And that's fumble fingers. These are the girls, dull, drab, and boring. Don't get angry, ladies. I'm just talking about the birds and the kids. And the kids are all speckly and goofy, just like all kids. So, bluebirds are in the thrush family. 
And before your eyes roll back and you think I'm going to get into ornithology, you all know what a thrush looks like. Who's that? That's a thrush. Robins are thrush. You're up here in the mountains, you probably know this guy. Thompson Solitaire. Nobody knows this one because he's a hermit. I heard that. Somebody knew that. And that, of course, is our mountain bluebird. So thrushes, that's the family. And by the way, if you look at them, structurally, these birds look the same. Okay? None of them look like a duck. Okay? So they're a thrush family. Bluebirds are secondary cavity nesters. And this is where it really gets important. What we do really gets important. Secondary cavity nester means you are obligated by your genetic history to nest inside a cavity, a hole inside a tree. Was the old natural thing until man came along and converted them all into houses. Uh, but you can't make the hole. Woodpeckers can make a hole, put their nest in there. Bluebirds can't drill a hole in the side of a tree. They have to find an old woodpecker nest or a sapsucker nest, or some other kind of cavity, any kind of cavity. They don't care. And if we were using my computer, we're using some of these fancy Apple thing here, my startup screen has a picture of a female bluebird getting ready to feed a big bug to her babies who are in a nest in the coupler of a railroad car. If you look at the coupler of a railroad car in, in the back where the mechanism is, there's a cavity. And she had built her nest in there. The good thing is, it was a scrap car. This thing wasn't going to get coupled into, because if it was, they were, they were lost. So they're secondary cavity nests, which means they cannot be very specific or... Uh, they choosy, that's a good word, about their selection. Robins just build a nest in the tree, and they can pick any tree in any place they want. These guys got to find a hole that somebody else made. They eat insects and berries, which is like the robins. Uh, basically, in the summer, they're primarily terrestrial insect eaters, grasshoppers, grubs, crickets, guys on the ground. I have seen them hawking insects in the air. Uh, in the winter, they switch to berries. And in the winter, he, most of Colorado, they don't stick. They go south. They go south far enough to find food, which means something else. Southwest, southeast Colorado, uh, the Oklahoma Panhandle, down along Black Mesa, that area is loaded with juniper trees. And if there's a good crop, that's as far as they go. And a Christmas bird count several years ago up on Black Mesa, right there where those three states come together, they counted 4,000 mountain bluebirds. That's in a 15-mile circle. Yeah, that's where all our birds were. In other places, like in Michigan, where it gets a lot colder than a lot of Colorado, they stick because there's lots of berries and bushes and things that they can subsist on through the winter. So it's not the cold that drives the birds out, it's the food supply. We have all three species. They're scarce on the prairies, not too many cavities on the prairies. They don't use prairie dog holes. They will not nest in the, they will not, I've been asked that question, how come they don't use the prairie dog holes? Well, prairie dogs are, smell bad, and they got fleas. Uh, common in the foothills and the mountains. So, a little bit about their history. Mountain bluebirds, the guys show up first in February, and they come up in these loose little flocks of guys. And I actually had the privilege of escorting a bunch of them once. I was doing a raptor survey way down in southeast Colorado, and it was a February uh, survey. And as I was driving north out of Pinion Canyon area, I had a flock of male bluebirds flying alongside of me for about 20 miles on these dirt roads. It was, it, I felt special. Uh, Easterns and westerns usually live, arrive a little bit later. And the guys come in first and the girls come in a few weeks later or a month or so later. And it's funny because when the guys first show up, they all hang around together and they lie to each other about what they did over the winter. <laughs> and then when the girls show up, it all goes down. Yeah? The way it is with 
teenagers, right? The guys hang on the corner and some cute girl comes by and one of them goes, oh boy, and he's lost to the crowd forever. Uh, typical small songbird courtship. The guys set up territories and the females will actually, once they're pair bonded, they'll set up an interior thing and they'll defend around the nest box and the male will more or less cover the perimeter. But at the outset, he's setting up territory, keeping the other guys out, and uh, does his singing and the, you know, like what we know these, all these little songbirds do. That's why we call them songbirds, because they sing in the spring. Uh, typical brood, five to seven. Five to seven eggs, five to seven kids. Down where I am in Denver, we usually get two broods in the summer. I've heard up here that usually you only get one. Okay, and that's because you've got a bit of a shorter season. It's food supply. Food supply is what drives everything. If, there's, if it's an early spring and there's plenty of bugs, these guys will start nesting early. If it's a late spring and the, the food supply is not there, she's not going to start generating eggs. Okay. Again, limited nest, nesting options. If, you know, I've already gone through that. Loss of habitat to humans. Now, when I put this screen together some time ago. I, that's why I said loss of habitat. I don't think of it that way anymore. I think of it as habitat conversion. Because habitat is like anything else that's material. It's never gained or lost. It just changes form. We are, as humans, we're changing everybody else's habitat to our habitat. And once it's our habitat, it's not their habitat anymore. Pesticide and herbicide dangers. This used to be a really big issue, DDT and all of those things back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. Now, I don't think it's as nearly as big an issue because we're using better chemicals, more biodegradable, and we're smarter about the way we use them. Okay? Anybody here remember the days your mother used to put DDT in your hair to get the bugs? For, for lice and stuff? No? no? Maybe that's why I'm the only dumb one in the house. <laughs> and they're often outcompeted by exotics. Hmm, exotics. You think of a, you know, somebody fancy dressed up or something's coming from Lithuania? No. Exotics are house sparrows. Okay. They are non native species. Any non native species is an exotic. We don't worry too much about starlings as long as you're using an appropriately built nest box. If your box has got the right size hole in it, a starling can't get in there. Okay? So, end of problem. Sparrows can. And boy, they'll go in there and they'll kill your bluebirds and they'll lay their eggs on their carcasses. I've seen it. Nesting cycle. Which reminds me, if you've got a, sp a sparrow problem and you're thinking about putting up boxes, don't do it. All you're going to do is create mayhem. Yeah. And the bluebirds never win those battles. Nesting cycle, five to seven weeks, the whole thing. Okay? Nest building is one to six days. The girl does all the nest building. The guy just sits around and sings and <laughs> breaks to his buddies. Egg laying, five to seven days. And guess what? The girl does all of that. Incubation, about two weeks, and the girl does all of that. Sounds sort of like humans, don't they? <laughs> right. Hatch day. All the kids hatch on the same day. Now, she's going to put one egg down a day for five to seven days, but she doesn't start incubating until they're all down. Consequently, they all develop from the same start point, and they all hatch at the same time. It's called synchronous hatching. Some birds, like raptors and cranes and others, are asynchronous. They start incubating immediately. That's why, have you ever seen a picture of a line of screech owls on the branch and it's like mama and the oldest kid and the next one and the next one? They look like Russian stacking dolls. Yeah. yeah. Brooding is, oh, another thing about having just a single hatch day. I forgot, this is very important. It's very easy for mom to remember the birthday. She only has to make one cake. You guys are tough. <laughs> Brooding. For the first few days, these birds, like most 
what we call altricial birds. The babies are born with their eyes closed and naked. No feathers, no nothing. You'll see pictures of them later. They're sort of like human babies. Only their mother could love them. And uh, so for the first few days, they cannot even thermoregulate. They cannot even maintain their own body temperature. So mom will, it's sort of an incubation process like with the eggs. She'll help keep their body temperature at a constant rate until they can do it themselves. And kids grow for about another 8 to 17 days. Well, more. And then fledging, 14 to 23 days after hatching. Usually about 18 days after they hatch, the kids are going out the door. How long does it take us to get a kid out the door? 18, 18 years, if. Now, they have a technique that I will mention later about how they get those kids out the door in 18 days for those of you who can't get your kids out in 18 years, okay? <laughs> it's got a lot to do with food. Demographics. So, mountain bluebirds. Now, this data is from the Breeding Bird Atlas that was done back in the 1990s, and they did not do a census, but they did an extrapolation based on uh, the data that they did collect. So, the population estimates are really wide. And it, they guessed there's anywhere from 114 to 879,000 of these guys in Colorado. That's a pretty good population, no matter which end of it you're looking at, really. And they're all over the western two-thirds of the state. They're not in the eastern third because that's prairie. Their range is western North, Amer North America from Alaska to Mexico. Okay. Habitat, pinion juniper scrub, alpine montane, aspen, grasslands. They like meadows, but they'll nest in, in Ponderosa, open Ponderosa parks. And one of the problems we've created for these birds, and especially for the western because they really like the uh, Ponderosa, is with fire suppression, we've created a lot of understory in a lot of our Ponderosa forests. And these guys can't get to the bugs that they like. And the bugs that they like aren't in places that are covered, have a lot of ground cover. So. And this part I love right here. 13.5. It was a hole in the side of an old miner's cabin up on the side of Mount Bross. Yeah, any port in the storm. These guys will take any cavity they can find. Uh, tractor, tractor exhaust pipes. Uh, did I skip something? Hold on, oh, okay. I thought I had a mountain western and eastern. I couldn't find, never mind. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a couple hundred of them out in the eastern prairie. No, well, in the riparian areas. And they're, we don't know for sure, but up until a few years ago, we, were, we had a pocket of eastern bluebirds in Grand Junction. Last time I looked, Grand Junction was on the other side of the Rockies. They were nesting in boxes on a golf course. I don't know how they got there. My suspicion is Amtrak, but I don't know. Uh, but their range is east of the Rockies from southern Canada all the way down into su Central America. And they are the most populous of the three species. Their habitat is mostly riparian and Ponderosa parks in this part of the world. Now you go back east, I have no idea. The, the woodlands of Tennessee, and I've seen boxes in southern Illinois. Western bluebirds, population about 16 to 97,000 estimate. Not nearly as many of them here as there are mountains, but there are more of them in other areas. Up, I think Montana has a lot more of them. Front range, and they're along the front range where I am. Uh, and if you think of a triangle from Grand Junction to Pagosa Springs to Cortez, that quadrant, that's a stronghold for the westerns. And they're in southern Brit British Columbia and Wyoming, on down to Mexico. And again, Ponderosa Parks are some of their favorite places to be. Now, see that mouth? This is a man-made fence wall. This woman sent me this photograph and called me up. And she was all excited. She lives down in heavy mountain bluebird territory. And she says, isn't this wonderful? 
I've got these birds nesting in my stone wall. And I thought, oh. she says, we just had our house built, and it's a, you know, f we just moved in, and I went, these birds come back to the same nest sites year after year. These birds were probably nesting in a tree hole on that property. The property got bladed, replaced by her house. Birds showed up in the spring and went, whoa, what happened? There was this rock wall, it's a, you know, no mortar, you can see what it is. This, is. this is a deadly nest site. All kinds of predators, everything from insects, ground, you know, ants. You know, there are some species of ants that will get into these kids. Uh, snakes. Who else? You know, that's a lousy nest site. So, and as I mentioned earlier, not many of these left. That's a natural cavity. And that's a natural western bluebird. And the good thing is they readily take to the boxes. Again, if, if you've got to find a hole and you can't make one, you'll take whatever you can find. And these nest boxes, over years, people have figured out what's, what works, what doesn't work, what's the safest, what's the best, even what direction to face them in. We face them away from the prevailing storm tracks. Too cute. This is cute time here. Mountain bluebird on a box. Mountain bluebird on a pole. It's hard to believe that color blue exists in nature. And I'm told that it doesn't really, that that's refraction. It's, the feathers aren't really blue. I can't, I, I can't wrap my head around that. It's blue. <laughs> OK, not all blue birds are bluebirds. OK, quick quiz. Who's this? What kind of scrub jay? Oh, woodhouses. You're correct. It was West, that was a Western scrub jay last year. They changed the name of it. When I did this program yesterday, everybody said Western, except this little 10 year old girl said, That's a Woodhouses. Maddie, Maddie was there. Yeah. Is that her name? Oh, I fell in love with her in a minute. Wow. So, Blue Jay? Who that? Pinion. And, and indigo bunting. They're all blue. And actually, these guys and these guys will eat your bluebirds. So, you know, that's what, that's what Jays do. And not all nest box users are bluebirds. Matter of fact, the second most common user of our nest boxes in this state are tree swallows. The guys, these guys right here. And some people say, oh, geez, I don't want tree swallows. Hey, tell you what, oh. you'll learn to love them. They are beautiful. They're amazing flyers. And uh, I'll talk a little more about some of the stuff they do. And violet greens, you guys got violet greens up here. We seldom see them down where I am. Red breast, white breast, nut hatches. These guys are all nest box users. Chickadees, both black caps and uh, mountains. House wrens who are wonderful little things, but they're horrors when they get in your box. First of all, if you got your boxes in the wrong place and these guys get into them, first thing the, old, the guy does is he goes around and fills all the boxes with sticks. He's only going to use one, but he's going to fill the rest of them with sticks. <laughs> and they're also a horror because they use sticks. And that little gray box on the side here, some, some of you may not have seen, these are boxes are all display nests, different types of nests, different species of birds. The gray one shows the house wren nest. They build the sticks right up to the ceiling, and then they have a like, little tunnel to the back where they have their nest, and you can see it right in there. Well, most of our boxes, especially the ones that open in the front or the side, when you open it, the top goes in. Guess what? It can't go in because of the twigs. You can't see what's going on in there. So they're very private. 
And the guy in the bottom right corner is somebody you probably don't get around here. That's an ash-throated flycatcher. You get those down around Canyon City and the banana belt. Tree swallows, second most common users. And, and they're blue. <laughs> yeah, they have this wonderful iridescence. And they are great flyers. Uh, they're smaller than bluebirds, but in a man-on-man -man battle, more often than not, they'll win because they're quicker. It's, they're sort of like a little fighter jet against a B-52 bomber, okay? The bomber ain't got a chance. So they arrive in April, May, and they're more gregarious than bluebirds. So if you put your boxes, if you have your boxes too close together, you'll get swallows and you'll never get bluebirds. Bluebirds, once they start nesting, really don't like each other. They want to be at least 100 yards apart. The further apart they can be, the more apt you are to get bluebirds. Aerial hunters, these guys are acrobats. If you watch them, if you're out there monitoring your boxes and these guys are in there, just take some time and watch them. They turn themselves inside out. And they'll turn you inside out watching them. Romance with feathers. If you're out there and you got tree swallows, get some feathers from local chickens or out of your pillow or whatever. Make sure they're legal feathers. This is the 100th anniversary of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Don't go to jail for it. You can't claim you didn't know that law didn't exist. You can't use native bird's feathers. But get, you know, some oh, about that big of feathers. You get a breeze going, put them up in the air when those birds are out. They'll come in and grab them in the beak and take them into the box. They build a canopy over their nest of feathers. It's the most beautiful thing you ever saw. And at the end of the season, their nest is the nastiest thing you ever saw. <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit. Several pairs may gang up on you to defend a box. I've had this experience. I've been attacked by six tree swallows at once. They don't injure you, but they give you a heart attack. Because <laughs> they come flying at you at about 870,000 miles an hour and they get right about here and they go eh, eh. <laughs> and if you don't jump you ain't human and they just keep coming at you and coming at you it's like you know strafing runs and uh, it's fun in a way but it's unnerving in a way too I mean these guys don't even weigh an ounce and you know I'm 150 pounds and I'm hitting the deck uh, their typical brood is four to seven a lot of times though six or seven and they only fledge one brood per summer because they come in later, their primary food are the aerial insects. That's what it looks like at the beginning. I've got a paired box of tree swallow nests here, a beginning box and an end box right here. Take a look in there, but don't put your hand, don't put your hand in any of these boxes, but don't put it in the tree swallow one because it's, it's about that thick with fecal material. I'll give you a hint, okay? But isn't that beautiful? And those are not their feathers. I have found owl feathers. I found one that was all pigeon tail feathers. <laughs> I mean, those are big, stiff feathers. I don't know how they got them in the little hole. Anyway, so if you want to get involved, this is what you do. Put up some boxes in suitable habitat. Monitor them on a weekly basis. You can monitor them more often than that, but that's a minimum. If you're not doing it that often, this process happens so fast, if you don't do it at least once a week, you're not going to really know what happened. Document what you saw, and that's just, you know, making pencil marks on a checkboard, just not writing a diary. And uh, report your results to the Cornell Nest Watch database at the end of the year. Or, as of last year, they have an app for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can go out with your smartphone and go, doo 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 doo. Well, you can. I haven't quite figured that stuff out yet. And clean out the boxes at the end of the season, and that's important. Right? Now, if you think about this, you decide to go out and maybe accompany one of these folks that monitors boxes once or twice to see what it feels like. This is what's going to hook you when you open the box. Babies. Babies. And like human babies, only a mother could love that. See that big round black thing? That's the eyeball. 
it's closed. They don't open their eyes till they're about six or eight days old. And actually, I think these, this first slide, I think, is actually tree swallow babies. But you know something? They all look the same. <laughs> Coming out of the eggs, they all look the same. Now, these are two-day-old kids. See this? That's the backbone. See that? That's the target for mom and dad. It's the only thing in the, in the box that's bright. Okay. Four days old. Remember the guy on Seinfeld? The big tall guy? <laughs> Kramer, yeah. <laughs> Eyes are still closed. Six days old. Now, eyes are still closed, but look at this. Feathers. Wing feathers coming in. Eight days old, the eyes are opening, mouths are still open, yellow. Ten days old. Look what happened in two days. From that to that. The beaks are starting to form up a little bit, and look at the feather growth. Look at the feather growth. Stunning stuff. Thirteen days. Last look. If you're monitoring them, you don't want to open that box after the kids are 13 days old. Because they might go over your shoulder. They're big enough to flat fly, fledge, go over your shoulder, out into the grass. And if you can't recover them, and mom and dad can't find them, plus they're a lot more susceptible to predation on the ground than they are inside the box, you may have just killed your kids. It's not a good feeling. Uh, teams work best if you want to monitor for a couple of reasons. Uh, you got bears around here? Okay, you want to monitor in teams and you want to be faster than the guy you're monitoring with. <laughs> you don't have to outrun the bear. You all know this. You just got to outrun your companion. And you can trip him at the beginning too. Uh, but teams work best because, first of all, most of us have other things to do in our lives. We can't be out there every single week from April through August. Just can't do it. So I, I work with two other folks, the three of us that monitor that line of boxes. We're about 30 miles south of Denver. Seldom are all three of us out there. And usually that's, not, that's good because we get to giggle it. But uh, it's just, you know, gives you some camaraderie, plus it in, helps ensure coverage. Once a week, March through August, document your observations, clean out and repair, and end of season data reporting. I've covered most of that. There's the app. Yeah. I might actually try this thing this year. So end of season, Cornell has a database. It's called Nest Watch. They have a whole bunch of databases. They do feeder watch. They do uh, the great backyard bird count, all of these citizen science things that people like you and me, I'm not an ornithologist. My business was computer systems for Department of Defense. That's not exactly bird, bird watching. Uh, but I mentioned earlier that data sets used by researchers. One of these has an article in it, one of these Bluebird magazines here, although there's only one or two copies left. But somebody got them. If you see an article in there by a lady named Robin Bailey, She's the project manager of NestWatch. And they're putting this data together. They're starting to get enough data over a long enough period of time that they can start making some scientific assumptions and evaluations or whatever it is that scientists do. It's comprehensive. It requires a one-time data setup. You've got to tell them where your boxes are, how far off the ground they are. By the way, the ideal height for nest boxes for bluebirds is five feet unless you're seven foot tall, then it's seven feet. <laughs> it's whatever height is comfortable for you to look at. The birds don't care. They'll take a box if it's 20 feet off the ground. But how are you going to monitor it? You're going to shinny up the pole? Or? And you don't want it too low either. You don't want it down three or four feet because much more susceptible to ground-based predators there. Okay. Uh, One-time data setup, yeah. What direction the hole faces, you know. Uh, 
I got my wife to okay my GPS unit when I was trying to buy one. This was a thousand years ago when the GPS units were expensive and stuff. I said, I gotta, I gotta do the scientific stuff to figure out where these boxes are. I got it. It's free. Darn well worth the price. And that's their web page. And I have a stack of these little things on here, and you'll see this a little later. Actually, it might be the next slide. <laughs> Look at that. I got a stack of these. You can take them home. You don't have to memorize what's up there. But that's us at the top. Nest Watch, North American Bluebird Society. North American Bluebird Society is a uh, I don't, I don't know how to I define this, but we have about 60 organizations like the Bluebird Project all around the country that do the same kinds of things that I do. And we share information, and NABS, or North American Bluebird Society, is a clearinghouse for us to get together with each other, to communicate with each other. Uh, they provide a lot of information. There are fact sheets over here that they put out. Uh, and they have a bunch more. I just bought a couple of them, the early ones, like how to set up your nest boxes and how to get started kind of stuff. Uh, this Cialis is a privately operated website. It's run by a lady in Connecticut. It's very Eastern Bluebird centric, but a lot of the t facts in there you can apply to what we do out here. You have to be careful. You, you, you need to understand the differences between the birds to you use that sometimes because there are subtle differences. And there's lots of other websites out there. So these are the folks that provided the pictures. And now I've got a, about a 10 minute video called Inside the Nest Box that I'm going to fire up. Now I'll tell you right now, the guy who is talking on it, this was done in North Carolina. He talks funny. It's hard to understand them, but I'm sure you'll work your way through it. But basically, it's the nesting cycle condensed down into 10 minutes. It's a great watch. So is there somebody who knows how to fire it up? They took away my computer. They took away my video, told me to go in the other room. And when I came back, this is what I found. <laughs> waking up. Oh my goodness. I'll take one or two questions right now and then I'll wrap up some more questions after the video. Yes, sir. Um, I might have missed it in your opening uh, sentences but you talked about bluebirds arriving. Where do they arrive from? Well, the, the birds that we have here a lot of them just go, some of them, I think, end up in the banana belt in southern Colorado, down along the Arkansas River, uh -huh. uh, down into southern, way deep south Colorado. Uh, if you get down into that Black Canyon area, the Pinion, Pinion uh, Canyon, the mil big military area, there's a lot of junipers in there. And I have been in there, I've not seen bluebirds in numbers, but I've been in there where I've seen literally thousands and thousands of robins, as thick as thieves. Every tree, every juniper had probably two, four, five hundred birds in it. And they were all talking and singing. It was a cacophony. It was like a birder's heaven. But if those trees, last year when I was in there, those trees were bare. Those birds were probably somewhere down in New Mexico. They don't go that far because the food supplies are available. Are we ready? Okay. Eastern Bluebird. Cross the way up with me. Welcome to Bluebirds Inside the Nest Box, presented by the North Carolina Bluebird Society and the Cornell Birdhouse Network. This rare footage was taken from our 1999 North Carolina Nest Cam. It's fun, educational, and a must-see for all bluebird enthusiasts. Now, let's go inside the nest box. 
Here's the disc cam filming location showing you how bluebirds have adapted to urban sprawl. The bluebirds in for a quick feeding and off again. Now, have you ever wondered what goes on inside a nest box? You're in for a real treat. Here's the star. You would think it would build from the floor up, but look at this. Here's mom building the nest. The flutter in action is used to actually form the cup. This process takes anywhere from two days to a week. Now, notice how the cup is formed towards the back of the nest. Once again, there's mom using the flutter in action to form the cup. Now the finishing touch with the fine grasses lining the cup. There's the completed nest. Egg lay. Here's mom laboring to lay the first egg. See how hard she's breathing? Ah, immediate relief. <laughs> Look how excited she is. Look, everybody. Look what I did. There's our first egg. Eggs are usually blue. But there's a small percentage birds now two eggs, eight eggs. <laughs> and three eggs. There's four eggs. And now all five eggs. Incubation. Mom appears to be turning the eggs with her feet. Most birds do that. They roll the eggs. If you want to see something delicate, you want to watch a bald eagle do that. Dad brings her some food and she settles back down. Once again, she's turning the eggs. Hatched up. The second baby has just hatched. And mom carries the eggshell out. People ask me, how big are the babies when they hatch? This big is the egg. <laughs> Let's try that egg shield. A lot of times she eats these shells, and we think it's because it replenishes calcium, and especially for birds that are going to put down a second brood. And like in Texas, they put down sometimes a third brood. Uh, we think that that helps replenish the calcium in the body. This time, hey, she gets a dam. <laughs> Mom senses or something getting ready to happen.
watch, you can see the egg actually crack open. Dad brings food. This guy's a piper as far as I'm concerned. You see what he's getting there? Funny little things. The baby's hatched out. Mom's an eggshell pro now. The other eggs you'll have. Now watch the top right egg. We've time lapsed this so you can see the entire process. This is something that we rarely see in egg hatching without mom around for a clear view. The beak just cracked the egg open. Now it's starting to open up. Hello, world. <laughs> Look, Mom, my eggshell helmet. Day five, the nestling's eyes were still closed. Mom's bringing full-size grasshoppers. I'm gonna go right down the hatch. Mom usually carries out the fecal sacks, but sometimes she eats them. Dad feeds now. The nestling that has just been fed is usually the one that produces the fecal site. You take them away. The Dad brings in a cricket. Clean. Mom feeds. Hungry nestlings. Mom brings in another grasshopper, and who's hungry? There's only three mouse up because the other two were full. You've always wondered how these birds grow so fast. Watch this. Now that's what you call a mouthful. Help, Dad! <laughs> <laughs> you 
Yeah, better help out. I don't know if all birds have it, but most of the birds I know about have on the tongue. There's backwards facing forks about midway back in the tongue. Can you breathe? And they use those to pull the food down there. Are you okay? Are you sure you're okay? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Are you really sure? Okay, kid. Day eight. The eyes now open and are growing. Feeding gets more aggressive. You know, I see the same size book. Boy, what a difference three days makes. Notice how clean the box is even after eight days. Bluebirds are very clean nest keepers. Day 10. <laughs> Nestlings are really growing. Competition for food and feeding are now fast. Watch how fast this feeding is. Hungry mouse. Day 14. Almost full grown, nestlings are starting to get their speckled look with most of their feathers. Feedings are now even faster and more hungry mouse. Days, two weeks. Pledge day. 18 days old and time to leave the box. Now you'll find out how to leave the house. <laughs> now four. Now three. Mom and dad are calling and encouraging with food from outside the box. But they're not bringing it to them. They quit feeding them. I think I can. I think I can. I know I can. There he goes. Hey, where did he go? Looks like fun. Now two. Now only one left. And finally an empty nest. Job well done. Now for the question we get to ask the most. How do I put up a nest box? Let's show you just how easy it is. This ain't the Rocky Mountain. There's a nest box, a two-piece pole system, and a handle. Uh, this, this is all we need to get started. It's soft mud for about four feet. We're at an edge area about ten feet from the woods. The ideal orientation is somewhere east to north, away from the prevailing winds which blow from the southwest in North Carolina. Hammer in the first pole. Now, just slide the second pole over the first pole. Now let's put up the nest box. On the back of the box, just bent over the strap. That's a very specific just Slide the strap into the slot. By a specific manufacturer. And there you have it. The bluebird box is just that easy. People who make As you can see, bluebirds can be fun for the entire family. Until next time, happy bluebirding. Okay, so how much time do I have some questions? Okay. Questions, yes sir. Where can you get the best plan for a bluebird box? The best the best plan? Where can you get the best plans for a bluebird box? Wow. Because when you go on the internet, there's a zillion different ones. And it's all for bluebirds. Mm -hmm. And you focus on western mountains. And they have the hole anywhere from an inch and a half to two and a quarter inches. Yeah. 
Well, it's one and nine sixteenths from Mountain and Western. And uh, how about floor space? Five inches by five? Five by five. Five by five. Yeah. Okay. This box is very successful. This is, this is what, uh, yeah, actually this is uh, rough one side. Yeah, rough on the inside. Rough on the inside, exactly right. Because I built about 100 of them 24 years ago. Uh -huh. And they've lasted, but now they need to be replaced. But as I say, mm -hmm. the plans for the boxes are all over the place. Yeah, they are. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of individual preference in them. And anybody can say, gee, I built this box, it's the best box in the world. Put it on the internet and say, hey, here's the best box in the world. But this, this is the design that over a long period of time, the NAB, North American Bluebird Society, pretty much, this is what we call a NAB style box. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yes, sir. How old are the bird, bluebirds when they start having kids and how long do they have kids? How many years? Uh, how old are they when they start reproducing and how long do they live? How long, do how they long are they reproductive? Uh, well, they'll be reproductive until they die. Is what usually, Which is how long? Uh, the oldest one band recovery that I know of is nine years. And they, they reproduce in their first year back from the winter grounds. So when they're one year old yeah, is when they can start. A lot of times the first year I don't think they do too well. You know, it takes them a while to get it right. Is there any data that shows relative percentage of bluebirds that are out there that are living in boxes and living natural? No. No. And what, what is the best recipe for getting your box to be inhabited by bluebirds and not anything else? Good luck. <laughs> I think it's is it, there's no recipe? Uh, well, like mountain bluebirds, we like to put them on meadows, uh, the edge of meadows, uh, a place that's got, you know, an area that's got perch points where they can hunt from because they are terrestrial insect eaters. They like to like sit on a fence post or on top of a mullein or you know a tall plant like that. Uh, but they, generally speaking, they, mountain boomers prefer the open meadows or open parks, open ponderosa parks. Uh, so those are things. And if you're going to have a line of them, you don't want to put up just one box because although they are uh, very Territorial, they tend to travel in groups. So when they come in, they tend to come in in numbers, not in large numbers, but a, a group of three to seven to twelve. So you, you're not so apt to get a single bird come along and go, oh, I think I'll live here. It's, it's sort of a group effort until the hormones rise, and then territories get settled. Yes, ma'am. I've heard um, that you can place two computer boxes relatively close to yes. each other mm -hmm. and perhaps swabs are getting one and the other. Yeah, and I, I have a problem with that personally. I've not had any personal experience with it, partly because I don't use it, because I don't personally believe it. And the reason I don't believe it is the theory is that tree swallow will take one box and let a bluebird have the other. The fact of the matter is, at least around here, the bluebirds nest first. So how is the tree swallow going to let a bluebird take the other box if the bluebirds have been nesting for a month before the swallows show up? So I, I don't get that idea. You know, now maybe somebody can explain it to me someday. But At our house, we have two bluebird boxes, and a wren took over one bluebird the other, and as soon as the bluebirds become the swallows, come mm. yeah. We have a lot of that. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's another, that's a good point. Where you are with a single brood of bluebirds and stuff like that, your dynamics of nesting dynamics are going to be very different from what I see down 
at, at 7,000 feet on, yeah. on the front ranch because we get two birds. We all, our bluebirds invariably put out two birds. Mm. Okay. And they're western. Oh, what mountain. is in most of your boxes? Western mountain. or mountain? mountain? Oh, in your mountains? Yeah. Are you two birds? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Douglas, my boxes were in Douglas County, which is south of Denver. And that's sort of bluebird heaven. It's the Palmer Divide, the Palmer Ridge. And there's a lot of ponderosa, there's a, you know, and a lot of meadows. There's tons of mountain bluebirds out there, and there's a lot of westerns. But the westerns don't use the boxes that are in the meadows. Mm -hmm. I see I see westerns a quarter mile from where my boxes are, from the nearest end of my box. And my boxes run from two miles beyond that. But they won't come out of the trees. Mm -hmm. They're in the trees, and they prefer to be in the trees. Mm -hmm. Mountain bluebirds are much more ecumenical. They don't. They, like I mentioned earlier, railroad car couple. Uh, 13,005 on Mount Ross. They don't care. For yes. one place that for local residents where you can watch a lot of our, uh, they're hard to see, but a lot of our mountain bluebirds nest in the pipes of the ski lifts. So if you're hiking on the ski lifts in the summer, look at the ends of the pipes and there'll always be bluebirds going in. Yes. Um, yeah. Then my question to you, mm -hmm. Kevin, is, um, what does your group recommend as far as taking pictures and inside the boxes? Do you think there's any harm? No flash. Cost? No, just no flash, but no harm then? No harm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, no, no flash because think of it for you. If somebody puts you in a dark closet and then suddenly open the door and poof, <laughs> your eyes would explode. You know? But seriously, yeah. We, some people do that, especially with tree swallows, to get a count. Because with the tree swallows, they put that canopy over, she can be in there and you can't find her. Okay? She can be completely obscured by those feathers. And God knows what's underneath her. And if she's not in the box, it's also difficult. So a lot of, a lot of people will take a uh, cell phone and just, you know, sort of get her above the thing or maybe get it through the feathers a little bit and, and just, you know, it's not going to be on the walls of the museum. It's just to get a count. Yes, sir? Why do these not have predator guides? Don't need them most of the time. Really? Yeah. Mine were eaten out, my old ones. Yeah. And so I started building predator guides. Who, who was eating them? I don't know. Well, you don't know who's a predator. Flickers here. Right. Yeah. right. It, may have been, it may have been flickers enlarging yeah. it and thinking they would want to use it. Not, not for predation, but for them to use it as a nest box. You know, and you have to know who, who's out there. And that's another thing I should mention is, when you think about good territory to put up boxes, is who are the predators out there? And you don't worry too much about coyotes and stuff like that, because they don't get in boxes. You worry about raccoons, and you worry about bull snakes, okay? things like that. Uh, you know, guys who can get up the pole, raccoons will just stick a paw in and start pulling stuff out. If you ever get a box, you walk up to your box and the stuff is hanging out the entrance hole, okay. a coon's coming in there. Mm -hmm. Nobody else does that. If you find you know, your eggs have been pecked, or you find the birds dead with peck, peck holes, it could be something like a rent or it could be a house sparrow. Uh, but you got to know who, who else is out there. And the wrens we tolerate, and the swallows we tolerate, the sparrows we do not tolerate. Mm -hmm. If you're going to put up boxes, do not house sparrows. Okay? They have no redeeming social value. On this <laughs> <laughs> you can even put them all in a box and ship them back to England. Because <laughs> they're the ones. The first bird I saw, I went to India a few years ago. The first bird I saw getting off the plane was a sparrow. <laughs> and they are everywhere there. Yes? Do, do they often come back to the same site? Good question. Site fidelity. Yes, absolutely. A lot of times the same birds will come back to the same box. Not necessarily the same pair, but the male has the strong site fidelity. It's the male. I always, you give me two choices, I'll always make the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but they, they do come back to the same place. Okay? And we don't know, or I don't know, if, the, if there is a pair bond that extends year to year. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think there are people who may know that. I do know that if you've got a nest with six eggs in it, odds are about 100% that one of them has a different father. Mm -hmm. And we're finding out that that's not just bluebirds, it's true with a lot of these songbirds. Mm -hmm. That there's a lot of philandering going on. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you know, you think about it. Hedge your bets, hedge your bets. If the guy that you're paired up with really doesn't have good genetics, why not hedge your bet and get your genetics into at least one good one? Okay? And everybody does it. It's okay. Of course, if one catches another one doing it, they pound lumps on it. Any other questions? Yes, in the Is there a minimum number of boxes that you recommend? Uh, no. The more the memory, but you know, it depends on your space. Now, if you've got a, a yard in Aspen, I don't think you're going to get bluebirds. Okay? They don't like people. Actually, you, know, you just don't have good habitat for them. So they're not even going to come in here. And they do, they are, like I say, they, they tend to move in groups. They're very territorial once they get there. So you want to have a few boxes up. A pinion juniper, absolutely. Yeah, they like really like pinion juniper. Yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah, is there another name for the swooping menu? Is, that, is there a term for that, or is it just swooping? Oh, I don't know. The way they go. You know. Oh, the undulating flight. Yeah. yeah. Undulating. undulating flight. Yeah, that's it. It's called undulating <laughs> flight. I have, I have a bunch of freebie handouts over there. Take whatever you want. The more you take, the less I carry home. Take a look in the empty boxes, or the, they're not empty, they got junk in them, uh, to see what the different nests look like, what they're made out of, and what the different eggs look like. And uh, if you've got more stories or questions, come on up and talk to me. I'm, I'm here all night, or until they call me out. I'm in Douglas County, too. Whereabouts?